Oh, I'm Brian Jones. Back in 2020, I posted a 25 minute slideshow with commentary entitled Bovine TB and the Badger Cull. And I now want to give you an update of what has been happening since then. The previous presentation can be found on YouTube by following the link on the slide. Previously, I covered bovine TB's causation by Mycobacterium bovis, transmission from cattle to wildlife, diagnostic testing for the disease, the high emotional and financial cost to both farmers and taxpayers, and the government's use of exceptions to the 1992 Protection of Badgers Act to allow culling to proceed under license for disease control purposes. I described the randomised badger culling trial, which took place from 1998 to 2005, and the conclusion from it that badger culling cannot meaningfully contribute to future control of cattle TB in Britain. I then discussed how DEFRA have totally ignored all the evidence and rolled out this ineffectual, expensive and cruel destruction of an iconic, indigenous and much-loved species. I described the recommendations made in the 2018 Godfrey Report, commissioned by DEFRA and subsequently mostly ignored by them. I concluded that cattle vaccination would be the most effective way of controlling bovine TB, and that the recent downturn in bovine TB breakdowns was likely due to improved testing regimes and better monitoring of cattle movements, rather than culling badgers. Sadly and unforgivably, DEFRA and their subservient agencies are still ignoring all the evidence that badger culling is ineffective, inhumane, expensive, and being driven by farming policy and political ambition, not science. Since 2013, more than 200,000 badgers have been killed, inhumanely, and at great cost to farmers and taxpayers without achieving any reduction in BTB prevalence. Single intradermal comparative cervical tuberculin skin test remains the cornerstone for bovine TB diagnosis. However, it is a dreadfully insensitive test, and if infected cattle remain undetected within the herd, they can be traded on to infect other herds. The frequency of herd skin testing has been increased in the high risk and edge bovine TB areas, and supplementary tests such as gamma interferon and enfoplex are being used more often when sicked positives are found in a herd. These improvements have almost certainly been responsible for the reducing number of bovine TB breakdowns, but despite its proven superior sensitivity, the Activage PCR test for Mycobacterium bovis, which measures organisms rather than the immune response to them and is exquisitely sensitive and specific, is still not licensed for anything other than research use. Just still do not receive the protection they are lawfully entitled to. The 1992 Protection of Badgers Act criminalizes harming badgers and interfering with their sets, but exceptions permitting the killing of badgers can be granted under licenses given out by Natural England for the purpose of preventing disease. Therefore, the badger cull can only be lawful if it is effective in reducing bovine TB, which it manifestly is not. We still see frequent reports of set blocking and digging out by fox hunts, and badger baiting by organised criminal gangs. The police seem reluctant to enforce animal protection laws. In 2021, there were 61 intensive and 21 supplementary cull zones, covering much of the western half of England, where bovine TB is most prevalent. The DEFRA minister at the time, George Eustace, promised that badger culling would be gradually wound down but this year licenses were granted for 11 new intensive and 10 new supplementary cull zones. DEFRA clearly has no intention of phasing out badger culling. 
It does appear that DEFRA intend to reduce the badger population to near zero in the high risk area and to extend culling deep into the edge area. We fear that the current licensing requirements will be relaxed such that individuals rather than cull companies will be able to apply to shoot badgers in an even less regulated or monitored manner than at present. Wow. Describes the shocking scale of badger killing. 2013 and 2014 were the initial pilot culls in Gloucestershire and Somerset, which gave no indication that culling could be carried out humanely or effectively. Despite that, DEFRA gradually increased the culling areas and the number of badgers killed. It was quite extraordinary that the new 2022 badger killing zones and targets were not announced until late October, when that year's intensive culling season had already ended. It will probably be several months before the actual numbers killed this year are released, but the targets are a minimum 23,652. Maximum a shocking 67,801. The total number of badgers killed since 2013 is now well over 200,000 and local extinction is definitely happening. 15th of March 2022, ecologist Tom Langton and vets Mark Jones and Ian McGill published this important paper in Veterinary Record. They used DEFRA's own figures for epidemiological reports to compare herd incidence and prevalence of bovine TB in culled and unculled parts of the high risk area of England. The number of herd breakdowns due to bovine TB are published by DEFRA for the culled but not the unculled areas, but the latter can be calculated by subtracting values for the culled zones from values for the whole of the high risk area. By doing this analysis, Langton et al. produced convincing evidence that badger culling has made no detectable difference to the incidence or prevalence of bovine TB. This paper underwent intensive peer review and managed to overcome DEFRA's attempts to stop its publication. It's just one of the graphs from the Langton et al. paper. It shows prevalence of bovine TB in culled, red and unculled blue areas in all the years of intensive culling. Differences would not be expected in the early years, but if there was any effect, it should certainly have become increasingly apparent as the years went by. There were in fact no statistically significant differences in any of the years since culling began using a range of sensitive statistical tests. That's to say, DEFRA have contested the methods used in the paper and its conclusions, both in VET record and in a government blog by the Chief Veterinary Officer Christine Middlemiss and the Chief Scientific Advisor Gideon Henderson. However, it turned out that they had published erroneous data, which they then had to withdraw. When they published the corrected data, it became clear that there is no statistically significant difference between culled and unculled areas. They had originally calculated the average number of breakdowns in the unculled zones, that's the blue columns in their graph, over the whole period 2015 to 2020 as approximately 14%, but later corrected that down to 11%, not statistically higher than even in the zones that have been culling since 2015. DEFRA still incomprehensively insists that culling badgers is the reason that bovine TB prevalence is coming down. DEFRA may be intending to conceal the data for the unculled parts of the high risk area. Dr. Colin Birch of the Animal Plant Health Agency presented a paper at the International Symposium of Veterinary Epidemiology and Economics in Halifax, Nova Scotia in August 2022. It hasn't yet become a peer-reviewed publication and was severely criticised at the meeting. The abstract of the presentation states that, by 2019, the assignment of land to the Badger Control Policy 
left insufficient unaffected area for a cross-sectional comparison of bovine TB in cattle between cull areas and non-culled areas. This not only contradicts the Langton et al. paper, but also the corrected commentary by the chief vet and the chief scientific advisor. We believe about 25% of the high-risk area remains unculled, hardly an insufficient amount of land for comparison with the culled area. DEFRA seem to be determined to bury the clear evidence that it is measures other than badger culling that are reducing bovine TB. It would certainly be an embarrassment for them to have to admit that the millions of pounds they've spent on the cull has been unnecessary. We don't know the precise locations of culling areas, and without this information, the only way to compare culled with unculled bovine TB incidence and prevalence is to subtract DEFRA's published data for culled zones from data for the whole of the high-risk area, as was done in the Langton et al. paper. In March 2021, I submitted a Freedom of Information request to APHA for numbers of breakdowns in culled and non-culled areas. I also asked for their analysis of the percentage of the high-risk area that remained unculled. This was rejected on the grounds of unreasonable burden. They claimed it would take 46 hours to provide the requested data, and they also said it wasn't in the public interest. I appealed to the Information Commissioner, but she confirmed the decision on the same grounds, though she reduced the unreasonable burden to 38 hours, still in excess of the 24 hours limit that can be applied under the Freedom of Information Act. She also criticised APHA for not providing at least some of the requested information. I applied to the First Tier Information Rights Tribunal for a further judgment on the case, and the online hearing took place on the 1st of November 2022. I was able to give an introductory address, which argued that culling badges is not a justifiable component of bovine TB control because disease incidence and prevalence in unculled parts of the high-risk area of England has been found to be no greater than in culled areas. I was very strongly backed up by my expert witness, Tom Langton. APHA's solicitor used various precedents to argue that the case should be judged under the Freedom of Information Act, which allows rejection of requests for information if the time required to process the request exceeds 20 hours or costs of £600. They also argued that it was not in the public interest to release the requested information because APHA scientists would be kept from their more urgent duties serving the public. APHA probably already had the information I asked for and could have spent less than 24 hours giving it to me rather than spending a great deal longer and a great deal of public money preparing their defence. I wanted to make a very simple point, that the best science and the firmest conclusions are always arrived at through sharing of unbiased data collected through transparent processes. APHA should be grateful for the expertise of independent scientists like Tom Langton and his colleagues to arrive at consensus approaches to controlling bovine TB. Policy should be determined through scientific methodological rigour, integrity, impartiality and transparency. I received the judge's decision on the 22nd of November, and although this was not in our favour, several supportive opinions were expressed. APHA had argued that the Freedom of Information Act guidelines should be applied to my request, but the judge agreed with me that the environmental information regulations were more appropriate, and this meant that there should be more leeway in deciding whether the request for information was reasonable and in the public interest. APHA argued that killing badgers would not affect biodiversity. But the judge disagreed and clearly went along with our argument that badgers are apex predators in the wild food chain. The judge recognised that our main aim was to obtain information required to show whether badger culling is effective or not. 
she agreed that the argument for disclosure was undoubtedly strong, saying badger culling involves a lot of time and public money. It is controversial and expensive. If culling is not effective, the focus on culling as a solution may mean that other more effective ways of controlling bovine TB are missed or not given sufficient focus. The ruling also indicated that the Langton et al. paper was strong enough to demonstrate the lack of difference in disease prevalence in culled and unculled parts of the high-risk area. And this was why the unreasonable burden issue was supported. If we appeal to a higher court, we will attempt to show that the requested data would provide information that is additional to Langton et al. and would contribute to a better understanding of disease, of disease control. Mine is by no means the only challenge to DEFRA's badger culling policy proceeding through the courts. The effect of slaughtering huge numbers of badgers on biodiversity has been argued for several years, and we now have the precedent from my tribunal that this is officially recognised. Informed accounts of legal proceedings against badger culling can be found in the Badger Crowd blog, and the link is on this slide. to me are the facts that need to be recognised by DEFRA and also the general public, so many of whom remain ignorant of the cruelty, enormous expense and the effect on biodiversity of the badger cull. Badgers does not reduce bovine TB. Enhanced testing and increased cattle measures do. Killing badgers is inhumane and a waste of taxpayers' money. Vaccination of cattle will end TB, and this should be at the centre of DEFRA's scientific research effort. Thank you for listening. I'd be very happy for you to share this presentation, especially to those friends who remain unaware of just how badly our countryside, our farmers and our wildlife are being let down by politicians.